Well, Terry, I think we're uh, ready to roll. Um, take it away. Okay. Well, our speaker tonight, Nick Stover, is a professional nature and landscape photographer. Uh, he's already mentioned he has uh, Colorado roots, uh, although he's currently, well, currently he's based in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> I've been but, deported the other way. Right. They, they've chased him out of California. Um, I, I don't know if it had something to do with the governor. But, uh, or no, some... I don't know. It didn't, didn't cross the governor this time around. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he, he grew up in uh, Carbondale, Colorado. So uh, he, he grew up uh, surrounded by uh, some pretty spectacular nature. Uh, he takes wonderful uh, images himself. Uh, however, he dedicates much of his time to educating other photographers. Uh, in the last few years, he's been organizing speaker series where extraordinary photographers talk about their crafts. So I've seen some of those. They're really uh, been very enjoyable to actually hear from some of the people that I've always admired. As he puts his philosophy and his mission, it's to help nature photographers who are interested in deeper connections create more impactful images so they can confidently and consistently express themselves. He's, a, he's been before us before, and I think you know from that that uh, he's very clear about uh, his uh, suggestions and he's very professional in his presentation. So I'm really much looking forward to his presentation tonight. Uh, tonight, he's going to give us some perspective on printing, uh, as well as some of the uh, a dive into the nuts and bolts of actually doing it. Uh, when I started this club, I assumed that becoming a competent photographer was almost entirely about learning camera techniques and editing. It never occurred to me that presenting the presentation of images either electronically or uh, print, was also an important competency to, to learn. Um, as will be evident from Nick's talk tonight, learning to pr print well has some modest challenges that require some attention and modest skills to overcome. And he's gonna walk us through some of that. With uh, how much other to do, I, uh, Nick, would you like to say a bit more about yourself or your activities? Yeah, geez, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say beyond that. It was a, it was a great intro. Thanks, Terry. It's uh, the worst mm -hmm. is when you give somebody a, a bio and they sit there and literally read it word for word versus, you know, kind of adding to it for what it's meant for you, et cetera. So thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad to be uh, joining when my, as I mentioned, I'm in Mexico right now and my, my wife came up with the trip a couple of weeks, three weeks ago. I thought, well, geez, maybe I, I should just reschedule. But I was like, no, I've had really good interactions with Focus. I've had uh, Terry came out and did a workshop with me. Uh, I have roots back to Colorado, obviously, that I, I like to still uh, do there. So I figured I would still take the time to speak, be with you guys this evening as well. So I'm excited. Actually, just realized, coincidentally, my uh, back screensaver, as you can see here, is actually just outside of Telluride last summer, uh, photographing that's looking down at the LaSalle's in Moab. But, just some really, really interesting lighting here. I'll kind of move so you can see it, but really interesting layers and lighting and kind of the whole thing all the way through there, which was lots of fun for sure. So I'm going to start my screen share. Okay. And um, then do that, I just wanted to say, this is Carl. I'm the club president this year again. Um, I just want to say that uh, I would ask everybody on Zoom to mute so that we can uh, not interrupt Nick in, during his presentation. And at the ed end of the presentation, um, I've got a few bullet points about the club, about this year, about some other things that I want to go through. So we'll we'll wait until the end and, and after you're done to go ahead and go through those things. So people hang Perfect. on at the end. There's important news coming. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> there might be some good uh, stopping points in the presentation, though. Uh, so I appreciate you being on mute so you don't uh, fall asleep if I put you to sleep and start snoring. Uh, but if you do have questions, um, this is a presentation and a topic I've uh, talked about enough over the years. I can I can tolerate interruptions. Um, 
And if it's something I have coming up or we can address, I'll, I'll do that. So I can, we can certainly stack up questions at the end, but we also can kind of take them as we go through uh, if it's really pertinent or you can catch a concept of what I'm talking about. Um, okay, good. So good. as introduced by Terry and kind of through everything else, my name is Nick Stover. I am a full-time professional landscape photographer. I'm based in San Luis Obispo, California. It's out on the central coast, uh, kind of equidistant between LA and San Francisco. Um, so I make my living as a photographer through kind of three main purposes or three main ways. One is through uh, a small number of workshops. The other is through the speaker series, which I'll talk about later. Um, but that big portion of my income actually comes through selling my work. Um, so I sell at uh, four to five art regional art fairs a year. I just keep them regional on the Central Coast, um, specifically do that. So every year, I was actually thinking about earlier today, I spend well over $30,000 in prints. Um, I purchased well over 30,000. The vast majority of those are metal prints. Um, it's definitely a big showcase of my work and the big thing that connects with a lot of clients. And so along the way, I'm gonna share a lot of my lessons learned and maybe kind of shortcut some of these issues uh, that I've encountered or ran through over the years, uh, kind of some of the tips and the tricks I use all the way through. So it should be really exciting uh, to talk through. This is one of my, uh, definitely one of my passionate portions of what I teach. And when I teach, as mentioned by Terry, is that's to help uh, photographers who are interested in deeper connections, create more impactful images so they can confidently and consistently express themselves. So this mission isn't about producing beautiful images or showstoppers or the next Instagram snaps or whatever you wanna think of, as much as it is about creating images of impact. Uh, and these images of impact are gonna convey and communicate different things for different people at different points in time, kind of throughout their creative journey. Uh, so the speaker series that we're currently in right now, we had Guy Tall last week, um, and he spoke about a topic called Be Extraordinary. Um, and this was an example of that where um, we had a, I had a decent amount of negative feedback about Guy's presentation because he was really spending a lot of time on philosophy and some of the deeper concepts of photography. Um, so that's kind of what I strive for in a lot of the work. Yes, we're going to focus on some of the fun. We're going to focus on some of the other things, but times it's going to make sense to look a little deeper within our work and kind of go a little through. So uh, that's what I do through nature photography classes. Maybe you'll get to join me. But tonight we're going to talk about what we're going to be doing and what we're going to do. So the top mistakes uh, made in printed images that I've seen both through critiquing people's work, uh, also my own work, and talk a little bit about color calibration. I'll talk about cropping. Uh, I'm going to talk about color spaces, which is called ICC profile print materials, print options. Uh, usually if I'm in my home studio, I can actually physically show you in the, in the particular things what something looks like or why I choose it. Uh, I don't have that option tonight, um, but I can talk about them, pros and cons of different materials, print companies I've used and maybe I would recommend uh, for you guys to use and definitely ones to avoid. Uh, and then we're going to possibly, if we have time at the end, which I uh, I don't have my Lightroom catalog. Uh, we're gonna work on the images. Uh, that's actually part of another thing. I usually work on images that are submitted and I'll talk about that uh, in a second. So one thing I will say is I'm gonna offer you the best deal in photography. And I literally mean this. So if you find value in what I talk about tonight, you're gonna have a copy of the recording through Focus Camera Club, but you can also get a PDF of the presentation and other materials, uh, a copy of my preparing my images for print workflow, uh, two other classes I've taught related to photography. One is, uh, excuse me, two other related to printing. One is called Fixing Some of Your Issues in Post-Processing. I'll show you things about like cloning, fixing blown out sky, how to uh, adapt some of the other things within their image. Uh, and then also my class on plugins for Photoshop. Um, so those three classes in themselves are really valuable, but the thing that's more valuable is there's a print credit for a free 16 by 20 metal print. Uh, from McKenna Pro, along with 10 free 8x10 regular prints. Uh, that in itself is like an $80 value. Um, so you can get all this for 35 bucks. It's on the main page on Nature Photography Classes if you go check it out. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as we dive in. So we're talking about the preparing for print module. Um, if you sign up for the course, you can get examples of what I do real customer, real submitted users or student stuff all the way through there. So I just wanted to mention that before we jump in. All right, so what are the top 10 mistakes uh, that I see in printed images? Number one, not photographing in raw. Uh, and I'll give a real example. So I'm gonna talk about these first before we jump in. The second, well, is setting the wrong white balance. And some of you will say, well, wait a second, if I'm photographing in raw, do I, do I have to worry about white balance? Well, there's two reasons there. One is, 
if we set the wrong white balance within the field or we're really, really off, that's one thing. But if we're not addressing that in our first step in our post-processing, that's a whole other. So not photographing in raw, or excuse me, not setting the right white balance is a big, big deal. Uh, I can tell you probably over half of the images that I've um, elected to not share, share publicly have been ones where I did not set the correct white balance. Uh, the other mistake, the third mistake, file size is not big enough. Um, so we maybe have a lower resolution file that we try to print at a larger size, or we try to print a pretty high resolution file at a really, really large size, and the file size simply isn't big enough. Not calibrating your monitor is the fourth. We're going to see uh, some examples I'll show you uh, of the difference between an uncalibrated and a calibrated monitor, but in particular, um, what that would mean in terms of cast or other things within there. Uh, number five, not cropping to the correct size before you resize a print. Um, so every print we take uh, or produce, we should be resizing to the medium size we're trying to print on. But sometimes you'll see somebody that's taking a five by seven print and trying to print it in a four by five sheet. And what's going to happen is it's going to start to distort and cut things out. So we want to crop and we also want to resize. Number six, not resizing the image to the exact specifications of this print. And I'll show you what this means and what some of the methods are. Seven, over sharpening. Um, this is something we can oftentimes do where we'll sharpen the image too much and we'll start to get a lot of haloing. Uh, too dark or blown out highlights, we can go in both directions. And this is where we talk about pure blacks on that dark side and pure whites on the white side. If we're printing something that's all the way black or all the way white, what happens is we don't get any detail in those areas and it becomes extremely eye catching. Um, and that's not usually what we want within our images. Nine, oversaturated. Um, so this is, I'll show you how to check this a little bit. Uh, if you have an image that's too oversaturated and how to do a little correction. And then number 10, well, that's a pretty simple one, not looking for dust in other spots. And I've had clients that have apologized to me. Oh, I'm sorry, I have uh, my sensor was dirty. And I'm like, well, no, no. Having a dirty sensor is totally fine. We all should have dirty sensors because we're out there, but not correcting these dust or other spots before we print can be a really, really, uh, troublesome things. So you print something big and all of a sudden it isn't what you want. So let's talk about not photographing in raw and why it's not, why it is so, so important. Well, first and foremost, when we're photographing in raw, we're actually getting 16 bit images, not 8 bit, not 10 bit, not 12 bit. So we, what happens is we get so many more shade values per channel. And that in itself is really valuable. Are we going to need to exercise every single one of these shade values? Absolutely not. But one of the biggest parts about RAW and the benefits, and most people are photographing in RAW, some people don't fully understand why they're doing that. The biggest value is in the dynamic range. When we talk about the dynamic range, we're talking about the range of light within our images from the darkest of darks to the brightest of brights. RAW is going to give us the biggest variety of those images and we're able to get through an image. So that's a big part. The other part, well, when we talk about bits, well, all files are converted to 8-bit when you save them to a, JPEG, a JPEG, excuse me. but you should never be editing in, in an 8-bit mode. You want to always be working in a 16-bit mode in Photoshop, uh, and, but you need to be making sure it's there or what is set is there in Lightroom. So, for example, most of the time, Lightroom is going to have default at 16-bit, but sometimes, and I've seen this more than one occasion, the external editing underneath preferences is going to have the bit depth set at something other than 16 bits per component. So if you are doing work in Photoshop or you're doing work with any of the other plugins, whether it's the Nick collection or Topaz or something else, you need to go into your external editing and double check all of these particular settings. So for me, this is what I have them set up. As. I have them set up as TIFFs. So when I export into Photoshop, it's going to go in as a TIFF. You can do a TIFF or a PSD. It doesn't really matter. Adobe RGB is the color space that I use. Um, some people will get into when we talk about color space. I always make sure I have 16 bits per component and my resolution for me is 300 DPI. And the reason I choose that is because that's what my printers are. So my Canon printer prints on an ideal native resolution of 300 DPI. Um, some are gonna be 240. Um, so sometimes if you have a lot of print work, are you gonna wanna do, be able to understand what your native printer resolution is? Uh, and then the compression, I have that set up to none. So as you're taking an image from Lightroom into Photoshop, you wanna make extra sure you're not compressing the image because uh, if you do so. 
how to determine or what is or what does this do for your printer. So as you work through different print labs or understand particular things, what do they accept? Or what do they want to see? So this is for Bay Photo, who I think is probably the best well known through a combo of marketing and good customer service for people to do their work. Well, they have very specific things on what they're requesting. What are, what kind of file format? What kind of bit size? Are they going to be working with sRGB or Adobe RGB color space? Those are the only two they accept. They don't accept on the other color spaces. Um, and so these things will help you to be able to determine if that's the right print lab for you and what they're operating in. Uh, the other thing all these print labs offer of any reputable quality is they will offer calibration test prints. Um, so if you're getting into something where you're wanting to print a larger portfolio or wanting to print more work and have it be accurate, um, you can do test prints from a lot of these different people and that'll be helpful kind of all the way through. So as I mentioned, Canon native resolutions are 300 and 600 DPI. Uh, Epson's are 360 and 720. I just, and then I can't remember which one's 240. It must be HP or one of the other ones. Um, and what the printers are able to do is rescale up or down uh, same way as print labs are. Uh, so I don't stress about having 600 DPI images. I just get them into 300 uh, and then my printer will scale up or down based on that uh, all the way through there. So how do you get to your DPI of your printer? Well, you can kind of calculate it themselves uh, to be able to take this. Uh, and then what's the difference between DPI and PPI? Um, so DPI refers to the number of printed dots contained within one image. PPI refers to the number of pixels contained within one image displayed on your monitor. So I still think sometimes I probably mess this up. Um, I'm getting better and better at it, but sometimes I'll say, oh, what's the DPI of that or what's the PPI? PPI is referencing the what you're seeing for pixels on your monitor. DPI is what you're seeing with your actual printed work. So just something to keep in mind there. Okay, so setting the wrong white balance. This is number two. Um, and if you ever were to come to my garage <laughs> in San Luis Obispo, you'd be A, just absolutely blown away by the amount of gear. I think that's a leftover from all my time in Colorado. But B is setting the wrong white balance. And that's literally wall, a couple walls within my garage of that. And so what we're looking for as we set the white balance. And so this is a good illustration example uh, of an image. So this is taken in Yellowstone, uh, September of 2021, uh, frosty morning. I have the bison coming out of this frozen frosty morning. So I'm wanting to convey the coolness, the cold, the freezing temperatures, kind of the, the whole scene, but I want that bison to be able to emerge. So when we think about emerging, we think about the tone well, cools, that cool is going to set a different tone than the warm tone and something on the right. And so as you're playing with the white balance, you could say, well, geez, I really need that orange or that yellow that's kind of on the bison's hump. I really want that to show through, so I should warm the image up. Well, what happens on the right, if you look at this image on the right, is by warming this image up too much, you lose that definition. We lose color separation in particular. The image on the left, I like to say my white balance was absolutely correct here because I have a lot of color separation. You can really see delineated, differentiated color throughout the entire image all the way back in there. It just doesn't feel extremely uniform all the way through the image. And I want you to see color separation because color separation in our images brings about depth. And depth is one of the major precursors and one of the major things we're able to work with within our images to really help bring out the dimensionality and what we're trying to convey. So for me, I want you to feel the depth when you look at this image on the image on the left in particular of that bison and the masses of this area he was in, the emergence out of that area and towards me versus just feeling one kind of uniform color like something that's on the right. So as we set our white balance, the key on this one, Areas that are receiving direct sun, those things that are getting, that are in the sun, not in the shade, should be warm. That's our reds, our oranges, our yellows. Those should be warm parts of our image. And the cool parts, the areas that are in the shade, the areas that are not receiving direct sun, those should be our cooler parts of the images. So that's where we're going to have things like our blues and our greens, maybe a little bit of our purples within there. So as you're working your white balance slider kind of back and forth, that's what you're gonna be looking for. So the areas where the warmth starts to go into the shadows or the shadows start to go into the highlights, those are the areas of 
you need to be the most concerned about because if you do it too much, then you lose that color separation. So that's the way to think about white balance uh, within your images. The yeah. third, yeah. Well, quick, quick question yeah. on, I, I, I know you said this, but I wanna make sure I understand it. Um, if you're shooting in raw, you're talking about getting the right, white balance right at point of post production or post processing. It 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 wouldn't matter how you sh shot it, would it? Correct. No, it doesn't matter how you shoot it, but you got to set it correctly in in post process post processing in post process. Yeah. Thank you. So that's actually a good. See, these are why the questions are good as I'm going through there. So. If I'm out within the field and I'm wanting to showcase or see a particular color tone more than another, I will change sometimes my white balance. So if I'm photographing in slot canyons and I'm wanting to see a little bit more warmth within there in my preview, just my preview on my LCD, well, then I might set something like a sunny white balance. Um, otherwise, I leave my white balance on auto white balance. I'm a Nikon shooter all the time, and then I will make tweaks and adjustments in post-processing. But you can tweak your white balance if you want to be able to look a little bit or get a preview out there within the field. So, for example, when I'm photographing night skies, well, my white balance that's ideal is about 3,800. That most accurately reflects the white balance I want within the sky. It's not always perfect, but it's going to give me a more accurate preview if I want that or need that level of feedback when I'm out there within the field. But in general, it's auto white balance, and then I make all my adjustments up. All right, third, not big enough file size. And this could be from a combination of different things. Uh, so some people say to me, well, all the time, I should say, well, aren't you worried? You don't have your, your images completely locked down on your website. People could theoretically steal them and print them, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, well, I sharpen them in such a way, I lower the resolution to 70, 72 DPI, which makes it really difficult to print. Uh, and then file size is very, very small. Um, so they could still print it if they ever wanted to in like a postcard type size, but they couldn't print it larger. So I don't worry about people stealing my images to print them. Um, a, I think people crave authenticity more than they're willing, <laughs> wanting to steal some has-been photographer from the Central Coast of California. But what it does mean is we do need to be considerate of our file size. And so I have photographers uh, that I encounter all the time that took images 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, that have said, well, yeah, they're, I'd love to print that image, but they're just too small. Uh, and sometimes they're right, but sometimes they're wrong. Uh, and sometimes these file sizes can be corrected through upsizing and other things, or other times you can just understand what your file size is and then start to understand the print sizing we're dealing with. So um, I don't talk about it here, but I do talk about it going up in terms of how we upsize our images could start to generate. So we can't necessarily take a, for example, a one megabyte file and make that in, turn that into a 40 by 60 wall hanger per se. But we can oftentimes take these smaller files and maybe go up a couple sizes. Um, so we could take like a, a four megabyte file and maybe we could get that into an eight by 10 or a 16 by 20 uh, to be able to print there. Um, so this is the reason with how cheap storage is these days, we should be shooting in raw, in uncompressed, in the large format, because file size is king. So the bigger files we can get, the more flexibility and the more options we have going forward. Number four, not calibrating your monitor. Um, so I use just a basic Spider X Pro um, to calibrate. It's, I don't know, I think I paid a hundred bucks for it quite a while ago. Um, I lend it out to people that are local. I've rented it out to people that are out of state and shipped it to them um, for cheap. Uh, I know camera clubs oftentimes will buy them for different people to use. Um, you can rent them from other things, et cetera, borrow them from a friend, ask around. It's really helpful to do even on the computers that come out of the box. Um, and this is going to be really hard to see within Zoom of the calibrated and uncalibrated views. Um, but I can tell you it gives you a wide variety of ways to look at it. So there's all kinds of different displays. Calibrator attaches to your computer screen and measures the ambient light that's there within your room uh, and makes adjustments and recommendations. It isn't just color calibration because oftentimes we will print, but maybe we're printing with our computer in a very bright setting or whatever else with our screen, screen brightness turned all the way up. When we get the print back, it's way, way too dark. And oftentimes if we calibrate it, especially in the price we were printing, we wouldn't get that issue. Why is calibration so important? Well, we see so much, which we'll talk about on the next slide, of green within nature. 
Uh, and this image is a classic example of that. This is in the Ho Rainforest in Olympic National Park. Uh, first time I printed this image, it just looked nuclear. There was just green almost everywhere, bleeding out, and I didn't have any of that separation. And what happened later is I recalibrated my monitor, and then as I printed and reprocessed, I should say after I reprocessed and then printed this image, well, now you can see the delineations. You can see some of the variations in the shades and the tones and the hues of the greens versus the yellows. Uh, and now we have that separation, the trees, start to feel distinct, the ferns feel a little bit different than the mosses, and they feel maybe a little bit different than some of the oaks, et cetera. And by calibrating, I was able to see that nuance. And I'm in no way a color purist uh, in my photography. In fact, I have certain colors I'm pretty oblivious to seeing sometimes within my work. I oftentimes will have my wife take a second eye on certain things, but calibration and being able to look at befores and afters has really been helpful uh, for me in my photographic journey because of this. So this is called the CIE. Uh, and this talks about the chromaticity diagram um, <clears throat> and what is also referred to as a gamut. And you'll hear people talk about gamut. Oh, what's the gamut of this? Or I need a wider gamut for that or whatever else. And gamut is the complete range of colors. And so what the color range represents, and we'll keep coming back to this kind of forward, is what do we see as chromaticity, elasticity, what does it mean? Chromaticity diagram, I can't, there's some other, CIE is an official thing uh, of some group and I can't remember the exact name right now, sorry about that. But it's a way we measure color. And what this means is this is what we see as humans. So we see a disproportionate, yes, completely unproportionate to the amount of everything else of green, blue green, bluish green, green, yellowish green, yellow green, greenish yellow and yellow. That is a massive portion, if you look at this horseshoe, of what we see. And this is theorized, goes back to our ancestral roots, of being able to distinguish within a lush kind of jungle type environment, the difference between food, the difference between prey, the difference between predators, everything else that was out there. So we as humans had to develop the ability to see so much more of the nuance of the greens and the greenish yellows and the yellows. So we see a disproportionate amount of that. So if we're not calibrating or if we're not looking at this, our images have a tendency to not show or not have those portions within there. So when we talk about the gamut, that complete range of color, well, the next part of that is what we get to show as our device's gamut, our display's gamut. So when we calibrate, it's going to show us the different uh, color profiles. So sRGB, which is what our devices see, or Adobe RGB, which is what most printers prefer. Those are gonna show you, and you look on the inside of it, how much of your display is actually going to be displayed on your monitor. So certain monitors aren't gonna be able to display the full amount of the CIE diagram. Others are gonna be able to display the full amount. But you'll see within here, which I'll show you here, the color gamut of our devices, once again, the complete range of color, well, this is the horseshoe shape of visible color as we look around the left side. And then these are the different color spaces. So Profoto RGB, Adobe RGB, sRGB, or just plain matte paper. And you'll see not any one of these takes all of that color horseshoe and gets it all in there. Profoto is gonna get the most, but not all printers can use it. Not all devices can display it or Adobe RGB is less. And sRGB is a little bit less than that and where they overlap, et cetera. So when people say, what color space should I use? Well, a lot, oftentimes that comes down to what is your print destination or what is the destination of your images? If it's gonna be for a website or just social sharing, et cetera, there's no need to stress about pro photo RGB or Adobe RGB, sRGB is gonna match, match totally fine because it's very close to the horseshoe shape of the matte paper. So it's gonna print kind of closer to that all the way through. So this is why I don't stress as much about it because if you look at these images, if you look at the overlays of the color spaces, the areas that you get more out of pro photo is much, much further away from the center parts of the image. This is the core of what oftentimes we're wanting to represent, not necessarily the fringes all the way out there. Because when we get out into the fringes, our displays aren't going to be good enough to show this. Our printing, our prints aren't going to show that level of depth and detail per se. 
So when we're working just on that inside portion, we're doing fairly well. Um, so if in doubt, sRGB uh, is a fantastic color space, maybe Adobe RGB. And then if you have a printer that's sophisticated enough as in a print company to work with Profoto RGB, or you're finding yourself saying, geez, I think there's more greens I could pull out of that, or I could pull a lot more reds. Well, then maybe at that point in time, uh, it would be a warranted time to turn to uh, Profoto RGB. So something to consider. Hey, Nick, this is Carl. I just want to interject real quick since we're talking about calibration. One thing I'll say, uh, I looked up on Wikipedia, the uh, CIE strangely is called the International Commission on Illumination. So uh, somebody dyslexic, I think, came up with the uh, abbreviation. <laughs> it, was years, it was probably Italian first, and then that we Americans tried to adopt it ourselves. So. It was back in the 1930s, so yeah. Who knows. Um, but um, what I wanted to say to, to everybody in the club, you mentioned that some clubs buy a calibration device. Well, that's exactly what we did um, just about a week ago. Uh, oh, perfect. We, we purchased a brand new Calibrate uh, unit that will do Apple monitors and you know LED monitors and OLED monitors, and it basically covers the whole spectrum. We had an old Color Monkey device, which has seen better days and the software doesn't support newer devices, but this new thing that we have um, is an awesome tool and it is available for all members to request and uh, um, all of our members should know that uh, just sending an email to vice president at focuscolorado.com uh, will put you in touch with David and he can coordinate to get you the device to calibrate your monitors. So, and I also just real quick, I'm sorry, uh, just real quick, I wanted to to mention there there were a couple of people club members who donated to the cause and i very much appreciate all your donations and helping the club to purchase that device for everybody to use um it's fantastic thank you <clears throat> that's great news just uh like i mentioned earlier i you know could have could have uh, rescheduled this one based on my trip and said no focus is a good group group i want to spend the, spend some time with them even on vacation so uh glad to be here i'm glad to hear that so um, so if we go to edit, how to convert color profiles, so that's inevitably, um, mm -hmm. this is where you go to edit, convert to profile. Uh, and this is where you can change your uh, profile settings. Um, so this is in Photoshop. Um, Lightroom, I'm not completely sure how to change the native. And I don't worry about it because I don't print out of Lightroom. I print out of Photoshop personally. Um, and usually if you're going to be super worried about color spaces you're going to need to go in you're going to want to be printing out of photoshop anyways for a couple of reasons i'll show you in a little bit um, this is where you could also set up particular profiles um, related to a particular setting or a particular printer you can import um, all kinds of different profiles in there hey i got a couple questions for you back on calibration i've been studying this quite a bit lately so my first quick question is do you invest in hardware calibrated screens and then recalibrate with the software calibration so i have the i have two screens in my normal i have the i have the imac i'm a mac user i have an imac 27 and then i have a oh shoot i'm blanking on the name because i'm not looking usually able to look right at it um it's a it's a non-hd monitor that enables me to see sharpening even better and it's from one of the it'll come back to me in a minute but uh one of the major ones and they're both 27 inch monitors um, so I don't worry about the factory calibrations because I'm going to recalibrate regardless every time, uh, excuse me, when I get set up into an office or a new space, because I'm measuring the ambient lighting within the room and I don't have any direct light on my computer screens or anything else. And so I don't have a professionally calibrated one. I just use the device um, okay. to do that. So you don't care about hardware calibration at all? Okay. No, I don't. Second question is, I've got a MacBook Pro and then I've got some other... I would just say crap monitor that I'm looking to replace. <laughs> <laughs> calibrate them in the same room, same time, recalibrate fairly often. Uh, I don't notice it drifting that much, uh, honestly. Um, I get the reminders every 60 days, and I usually click that for probably another <laughs> way too long, another three or four months. Um, what I usually do on my calibrations is I do – um, I won't do much printing from say November till March. Uh, it's just not print sale time for me. Um, and what I will do though, is when I get to March, I'll recalibrate again. 
or if I had a major other change. And so at one point in time, we installed uh, something out on our patio that allowed less light into my room. So I did recalibrate then. Um, so I don't stress about recalibrating. I used to, and I didn't see that much of a drift. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, from like every 30 or 60 days, I just wasn't seeing that much of a drift. Two, two quick more questions and I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah, so, yeah, no, it's good. On the MacBook Pro or any computer, obviously you have a brightness setting. So you just <laughs> good, set, good. Set Glad that you figured that out. Not everybody has. So, <laughs> well, do you just set that to fifty percent brightness and always go from that point? No, I do. Um, great question. I go to two clicks. Um, so I my monitor is quite dark um, in my particular thing, and I think it goes. And, and there's no exact amount versus some other monitors or some computers you can set an exact percentage. It's two clicks up from the bottom. So I go all the way down to the dark and then I two click it back up. And so I guess that would be about 20%. I think there's 12 clicks uh, in the brightness setting. Uh, and that's based on the ambient. I don't have any direct light in my room. I only have in my office, I only have one uh, sliding glass door and it doesn't get direct light in there. Um, so it's kind of not a dark office by any stretch, but that's why I have it the way it is. Okay. And then one last question. Laptop, you're obviously traveling a lot. You don't recalibrate in different environments. No, so my strategy on the lap, laptop is, and I'm trying to be more, even more disciplined about it, is all I try to do when I'm traveling is download my images to create a second copy and then weed through any just total junk images. I try to have the discipline to not post-process when I'm traveling um, and to then import everything back into my home screen, the bigger screen when I get home. Okay. Um, and when I do that, my images turn out much better. So. Um, I don't, I have my laptop calibrated, uh, but I worry even less about calibrating my laptop because I'm, I'm just doing basic post-processing there. Um, that being said, a couple of years ago, I was on the road for three months um, and was having to do most pro more post-processing on my laptop. Uh, and I didn't have uh, an external monitor with me and that was became troublesome. So if you're finding yourself traveling or away, and you have that external monitor, the MacBook Pro colors are fantastic, um, but I would definitely recommend a, as large of a screen as you can get for post-processing. Okay, I'll be quiet, thank you. No, great question. I think everybody else benefits from those type of quality questions, so. Uh, all right, so let's talk about cropping. Good questions here, kind of going all the way through. Now that we have the color calibrator, I think uh, the link was just put in there as well. So starting sizes, so. If we look to the right hand side, this is going to be where the vast majority of us start. Two by three aspect ratios are where most of our cameras are. Not all of us. There's going to be the Olympus shooters out there. There are going to be micro four thirds. There's going to be other cameras that have different native resolutions, but two thirds is the majority of the Nikons and the Canons and the Sonys, which is the majority of the photographers. So what that means is the native resolution without the native cropping ratios are going to follow this. And what I've highlighted here are my three most popular print sizes. So 24 by 36, 20 by 28, which is 24 by, which is 20 by 30, and 32 by 40, which is the 30 by 40. So these are going to be my most popular print sizes, the most popular sizes I print in uh, that fit the most level of spaces. And I go all the way up to, where do I go? 48 by 96 is as large as I can go, um, which is a different ratio, obviously, than anything you see here. The reason I mention this is understanding your cropping will impact a little bit of what and what size you might want to print later, but it also has the potential, okay, this is starting as a two by three, which is a 24 by 36. What would I have to crop or resize if I wanted to print it in a different resolution or a different thing? So always be thinking about cropping size within there because that's going to impact if you're printing. So the most common paper sizes, the most common print sizes we're going to be dealing with, five by sevens, eight by tens, uh, and then either 11 by 14s or 16 by 20s. And so I have a Canon uh, Pixma Pro 100. I can print up to 13 by 19s on it. Um, not quite even as large as 16 by 20s. I'm printing the majority of the time eight by tens or five by sevens. And an eight by 10 is a fantastic print size to determine if there's things I would change about the print. So test prints are incredibly valuable. So to print an eight by 10 print at home and discover right then and there, oh geez, I got a big dust spot in this corner I missed or I forgot about, 
well, gosh, this area is way too dark. What do I want to change? What do I want to do later? Is a lot better than printing it as a 30 by 40 on metal and then discovering that issue later. Um, so test prints are hugely valuable. Understanding the paper sizes that you can print um, at home yourself is great, or just to kind of go there. But uh, you can oftentimes work within these ratios to kind of get things to work. But that's some of you. All right, so then the next part, not correctly sizing our prints. And people say, well, I cropped it to an eight by 10, but it didn't look right. Well, what you're gonna see is within Photoshop, and this is why I use Photoshop for all of my printing, you're gonna also wanna image size it. And so if you go into image and then image size, and this is all covered in the workflows and some of the other stuff too, but we're talking about it today, you can size it to the exact printing diameter or the printing size that you're going with. So preserved, there's all kinds of sharpening algorithms or enlargement algorithms. I've done a lot of different tests on a lot of different things, talked to a lot of people that know a lot more than I do about printing, uh, and they continue to love the preserved details 2.0 within Photoshop. Yes, there's Gigapixel AI. Yes, there's uh, Lightroom has the other one, which I'm blanking on the name of right now. But preserved details is going to get you pretty close into this particular size. So when we talk about size and not correctly sizing our prints, what are we really talking about? Well, people are going to inevitably say, OK, I have a native size image that's an 8 by 10. How much larger can I realistically go before I lose resolution? And the answer is you can probably potentially, I mean like that, two caveats, probably potentially go four times larger. So if you have a native resolution file that's an eight by 10, you could probably go to something like a 30 by 40 using this algorithm to be able to print your image and it would look pretty good. Because if you get up to a 30 by 40 print and you're looking at it the same way you would look at a five by seven postcard, you're not looking at the print correct. You need to be thinking about the print from the dimension of it on the wall and the distance in which you're gonna be viewing that. And so if you get up to one of my really big prints, super close in, it's not in focus. And you'd say, well, this print's out of focus. Well, if you had it in focus when you were looking this closely, then when you're standing further back, the print's gonna be out of focus. So be thinking about the distance away that the print's gonna be in its final kind of resting location will dictate your sharpening, will dictate your resizing. And these things follow and they fall in really, really well. Um, so people sometimes, you know, I've heard people talk about well, if you're pixel peeping, and you're getting in really close, you can tell the sharpness of the print. And I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, I want to want to see that print at the distance it is. Doesn't mean things are going to be blurry or out of focus, but if you get in really closely, it's going to look bad regardless of what you're looking at versus if you're back at the viewing distance. And so correctly sizing is going to solve that. Um, so these are the things I was mentioning. Uh, Adobe Super Resolution, that's the one. It comes out of Lightroom and Camera Raw. It's helpful. Uh, Gigapixel. Uh, from Topaz AI. This is the experiment I ran on the Bison image. Uh, and then the Photoshop image resizer, which I mentioned, which is the Preserve Details 2.0 uh, that I like, and that's what I particularly use. Uh, but if you don't want to use Photoshop, these are a couple of the resolutions or things to consider. This is a whole bunch of words on a screen, but inevitably you have some really smart person that understands this stuff. What does each one of them do? Um, this is the particular things it does um, to be able to pull it together. And so preserve details. Well, a noise reduction slider becomes available for smoothing out noise as you upscale the image. These are all just all these kinds of different ways. But if you want to be able to understand what particular things are happening, uh, here's a reference charge in there. OK, so what are the ideals uh, for web displays and images? So you mentioned earlier DPI printed PPI uh, on the screen. So it's resizing the pixel width that matters the most, not the PPI. So if some people say, oh, geez, I need to go to this big PPI or whatever else. No. So I'm going to resize my images using the TK, the Tony Kuiper uh, web sharpen tool for 72 PPI. Uh, this presents to be printed as a larger size if it's stolen. It also really makes the file size a little bit smaller. And what I'm sizing for is the longest size image. Um, so a 1920 by 1440, that's what I'm sizing for, for the longest dimension size within that. Uh, and it's big enough to mostly fill a 1920 by 1080p HD monitor. And so I can take that print that I've now resized through the web, 
uh, and put it into a screensaver, put it into something else, put it on my website, and it's going to fill uh, and look the correct uh, size and dimensionality within there. The other thing and why I like the Tony Kuiper panel is it does two other things for me. One is it adds my logo. Um, so you can see over here, uh, it's my watermark. It's my next door photography thing. I like that added so people can know where it is or if it's mine or whatever else. It also converts it to sRGB. So remember we were talking about color profiles earlier. Well, sRGB is the web-based color profile uh, that our devices display. And so inevitably, you're going to notice at some point in time, the image on your screen does not look the same as it was on somebody's phone when you texted it to them, or maybe it was an Android from an Apple or whatever else, and you're going to blame on the Apple Android thing and so on and so forth. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it's because you didn't convert the color space to an sRGB color space. So what looked correct on your screen isn't going to look correct on another device or whatever else unless you convert it to sRGB. So the TK add-in is 35 bucks for the whole entire thing, which includes luminosity, masks, et cetera. It's worth it for me. If you don't know how to, if you don't have this or you don't want it as well, you can convert to sRGB out of Lightroom. You can also manually convert to profiles I showed you earlier, or you can set up your own action, or you can set up your own shortcut or your own memory thing to record that thing. And so you can hit that button within there, so. Hey Nick, on, on that particular topic, so for print, you're, so when you're doing your processing, are you processing in sRGB and then when you go to print, go into Adobe RGB? No, I'm always processing in Adobe RGB and then I'm converting. I create two files. That I get sense. to the final stage of my post-processing and I create two files. So I've, I've done all of my post-processing. The image looks the way I want it to look. I create a print file, which I'll do some adjustments and tweaks to related to going to a printer. And I create a web file which is what's going to get saved and eventually go on my website or for sharing or distribution. And, that, um, that, that, that and that's file. when I convert to sRGB. All right. So you're, you're doing Adobe straight out all the time. And then yeah, I'm doing Adobe straight out all the time. Yeah, no, good question. Tell me again what, I'm sorry, I'm missing this. TK8, I don't, I, is this <clears> an <throat> app you buy? What is it? Yeah, well, I don't understand why I can't follow all the vernaculars of all the terminology of the ways we speak and uh, Cryptic Carl language as photographers. So yeah. uh, it's it's the Tony Kuiper add-in um, and it's called TK, uh, TK panels. Uh, and they work within Photoshop really effectively. Um, Sean Bagshaw does a huge amount of tutorials and, and presentations on this topic. Um, but yeah, there there's a whole bunch of different things. The bulk of what people use them for is luminosity mass creations, but then they also have these combo panels and other panels that can just really speed up your workflow quite a bit yeah i just popped a link uh to tony's site in the oh good yeah so anybody who wants to grab that can yep i gotta i have a discount code i think it's just nick actually and i see i can't remember if it gets you 10 or 20 percent off but if you decide to buy it you just use the code yeah you're gonna make me ask another question so i'm yeah. getting <laughs> off on getting that panel because i've wanted to really enhance my photoshop skills especially all the basics and getting really strong at the basics of Photoshop and then use that tool. Would you suggest that or just go ahead and get it? No, I, I actually wish, I wish, I wish. If I could rewind one thing, well, I can't rewind one single app, I think of my photography, but if I could rewind one particular aspect of my post-processing, I wish I'd learned on in the tools, the, the TK tools before I learned how to do it myself. Um, I went through so much pain and effort of how to build luminosity masks myself um, that it was, I don't think it was, the juice was worth the squeeze in terms of the reward versus really understanding um, how the TK panels work um, was really helpful for me. Um, I think as I started to use those, I could start to visualize the light and the dark within the images by using the different selections much, much better. And then the ways these kind of shortcuts and other things uh, just became much more efficient for me. So um, I admire your tenacity and wanting to learn it all yourself. That's what I did the kind of the first time around, but I definitely would, would say there's, you can pick your own, choose your own adventures in here. There's a lot of complex things um, that you don't need to tackle right away. Like I still don't do subtraction masks. You can you know, add one thing and subtract another thing and take a darks and blend it together with this or whatever else. I don't even go there, um, but I use it for, you know, simple tools uh, that help me. Awesome.
So over or under sharpening our images and keep the questions going. I think they really help to make sure I'm not getting a too far off center and base of the value you guys see, um, but also covering what's applicable to you. So over or under sharpening our images, and we could do both quite easily. So when we under sharpen our image, we're not going to get that detail um, really kind of pushing through or coming out within our images um, that we want to see. Uh, when we over sharpen our images, like it was just the case here, um, well, I've over sharpened this image to the point where we're getting a tremendous amount of haloing. Uh, we're getting a lot of bright spots within the image. We're getting a lot of other things. Um, and we're not preserving that detail and those textures and everything else within our images. Uh, and there is a ton that goes into sharpening. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. There's entire, you know, I could teach an entire two hour class just on sharpening and I'm not even a sharpening expert. Um, but find a technique that works for you um, and use that particular technique and understand a little bit about it. You can do sharpening in Lightroom. People inevitably ask. It's not gonna be as targeted as you can get out of Photoshop. Um, and so that's the precision portion of Photoshop versus Lightroom is gonna be much more global, um, but you can take a look. Uh, too dark or too light or blown out highlights. These are another big parts of what we run into with images. So an image like this one would be a classic example. So I hit the J key within uh, Lightroom to show the areas that were too dark or too bright to help me simulate. And this is that example I was talking about. So the red you can see down through here, that's gonna print as a pure white within my image. And the black, the blues that are up here, that's gonna print as a pure black. It's gonna feel very dense. There's gonna be no detail within the image. So the risk we run when things are too dark or they're too bright is if it's too bright, that is where our eye is going to go within the image. We are programmed as humans to see the longest wavelength light the soonest. So by seeing that longest wavelength light the soonest, our eye is gonna go down into or away to those areas in such a way that we can't control the viewer's experience within our image. So I, as the viewer, or I, as the creator, I should say, or the photographer, I don't want you looking down here into the image. I don't want you in that bright spot. I want you fixated up here in the particular kind of, um, you know, rock outcropping area. This is just outside of Lake Powell in California. So as I'm post-processing, I'm keeping that in mind. I don't want you really getting lost in the dark, muddy shadows. I want you to focus on this particular area within the image. So be thinking about our highlights and our shadows within the image. Number nine is oversaturated colors. And how do we get away or how do we get around that? So this image, uh, it's probably more on the artistic side for me. It is a single image exposure, interestingly enough. Uh, one image capture, uh, 20 second um, sky exposure, ISO 6400 F2.8, um, light painted. That's how I got this effect in the foreground um, on the tree and on the ground in front of me through a lot of trial and error to be able to get the image. This one sells and does very well for me on the central coast. It conveys the beauty of sometimes we get those really beautiful um, spring flowers you've probably seen pictures of. We have this one area of the oak trees, etc. I print this one a little more saturated than a lot of other things because I'm trying to evoke a little bit of Van Gogh's Starry Night with Van Gogh irises, possibly, of that kind of feeling of the wonder and the brightness, etc. But um, I have different versions of it, and this is one example where it's just too bright. Um, so I'm going to go into check for something like this if it feels too bright and I'm going to go to view and I'm going to go to gamut warning. And this is in Photoshop and that gamut warning is going to tell me by going white that those areas within the image as it stands right now are too saturated to be able to print in such a way and they're going to come out very, very blotchy within the image. So if I have the discipline, which I oftentimes don't, but I try to on some of my more popular prints or everything else, I will check my gamut warning and then I'll go in and make those minor adjustments into the image. So I'll desaturate my blues a little bit. Maybe I'll take out a little bit of that green and I bring down the brightness ever so slightly and then run my, and then check my gamut once again uh, and to be able to see what's in the image. And that's exactly what I did. So the first time I printed this image, I kept going, geez, that is just, it's not looking right. I don't have the separations. You can't see the individual flowers the way I wanted as well. So I went back in, adjusted the saturation on just the blues and a little bit of the greens, 
reprint it again, and then I had what I was looking for within the image. Number nine, or number 10, dust spots. Uh, as I mentioned, this is from Iceland, uh, photographing there, long exposures, um, narrower apertures, I think I was F22, maybe even F28 or F29 on this image, those ones with long exposure. You're gonna see a lot more of those dust spots. If you're in an area where it's dusty, or in an area where there's just the teeniest amount of rain or whatever else, it's almost inevitable you're gonna have these. Uh, so making sure to clean those up uh, in Photoshop and Lightroom. So Photoshop has uh, a really good, good tool. The TK panel has a dust uh, cleanup tool that'll, see, that'll help you to see the dust. Lightroom has the remove spots features, which I think does really, really well as well uh, to be able to check and kind of find those within your images all the way through. So those are the 10 um, kind of errors. I think we're pretty good on questions, but if we have others before we move into the methods for printing, feel free to ask. So basically what are our methods or what options do we have for printing? We have a question. question. Yeah. yeah. You've got a couple, I've got a couple of questions. When you were talking about shooting in raw, I shoot in raw, that, that's all I shoot. But the decision that I have to make is do I want to shoot in medium, formatted raw or fine formatted raw. How much of a difference does that make, assuming that I'm not, you know, making huge, you know, huge uh, prints or anything like that? Uh, it'll it vary a little bit based on camera resolution and megapixels, um, but it, it's gonna be significant enough that you, you might, you'll probably notice the difference. Um, and the way to check it would be photograph one, uh, you could probably Google what your camera model is or whatever, uh, or you could photograph one in extra fine or fine and then one in, in the other version and then just check the file size when you import them. Uh, I tell people in this day and age, storage is cheap. Um, and it really is on memory cards and it is on external hard drives. I mean, I, I bought a four terabyte external hard drive for a hundred bucks uh, last year. And that's just, I can't even fill that thing up if I tried essentially. So if, if, if in doubt, you can always put them through. If you're just photographing in particular scenes or situations that you really don't aren't intending to do a lot of post-processing, maybe it's more family functions or something else. Um, all cameras can be set up to be captured in both raw and JPEG format. So you can have the, your camera can create both file functions at the same time. Okay, Nick, that was something I was going to mention is that on any camera I've ever used, any kind of medium, large, or anything, that refers to the JPEG file. It has nothing to do with the RAW. The RAW is always full resolution, full quality. I, I, I can't remember ever seeing a, a, a camera that had a setting for different RAW sizes. Yeah, I, I can, and I'd have to... I'd have to go through my 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 uh, raw my Nikon again and check, but I have seen clients with half size raw phones. So. Uh, a few more questions, if mm. it's okay with my colleagues here. Uh, you were talking about upsizing the images. Don't you lose resolution when you're upsizing the image? But you're gonna yeah. If you that's what I was talking about earlier. So if we're we're taking a five by seven postcard like this one, you're gonna lose that. You're not gonna have the same resolution at this distance, uh, six foot viewing distance, but you're gonna be viewing something like a 30 by 40 at a greater distance on the wall. So pixel for pixel, you're not losing resolution because of the viewing, the viewing distance. The other thing about the upsizing that happens and you can take a look at um, is you don't necessarily lose a lot of resolution if you resharpen the image as well. So if you take an image that's just a small size like this, upsize it and then print it, it's going to look a little blurry. But if you take an image like this one, upsize it and then resharpen the image again, you're going to not lose as much resolution as you think. Okay. My last question is, is there any way to shoot safely in high sand areas like the desert? <laughs> well, um, Last workshop I taught in the desert, I had a client that showed up with a uh, plastic wrap around her entire tripod. And um, I'm not sure that even solved the problem besides keeping some of the sand out. The biggest thing I would advise on shitting in there is, uh, I've, I've tried all kinds of things from hoods to 
other things in through is keep your lens cap on till the absolute last second before you need to take an image. Uh, the other thing is to have something you can put over the top of your camera in between images um, and something like, uh, so a, a, just a simple shower cap or something else uh, can be really, really helpful. Um, the biggest thing I can advise is don't change your lenses if you can avoid it. And if you do have to avoid it, face with your back to the wind uh, and then put your camera, put your camera between your legs and then really quickly switch between your particular lenses. Um, but if you can avoid doing it, you'd be absolutely shocked at the weather ceiling uh, that these cam these modern cameras have in terms of keeping out stuff that's out there. I mean, I got this one picture uh, from when I was in the Canadian Rockies a couple years ago, and the camera was completely covered in snow and ice, like absolutely couldn't even barely tell it was a camera. Um, got back to the camera, got back to the car, brushed it off, went on with my day. Nothing, never had another problem with it. I never had any problems with it at all. It was absolutely crazy. So Nick, you talk, have you tried Topaz upscaling where it'll take those low level density? Yeah, I've tried the gigapixel AI. Um, and the issue I have with the AI stuff, so I use Topaz Sharpen sometimes, and I use Topaz Denoise sometimes. Um, both of those can be really good. Topaz Denoise can be really good at obviously doing what it says it can do. Um, and Sharpen can sometimes save an image that's borderline un unsalvageable <laughs> and bring it back into something that's good. Both of those systems, though, you have to watch the artifact. Um, and so what you'll sometimes see in that and on Gigapixel AI, as you look around the image, you'll see things that just don't look natural. So what nature has is a lot of, flow, you know, kind of like flowing lines and curvatures or straight, straight lines. You'll see these artifacts that are very jagged and kind of angular within the image and where the pixels don't kind of blend from one thing to another. Um, so that's been the concern I have. That being said, I have not used Gigapixel in the last probably two years. And those programs, those companies are investing money in there all the time. Um, so it could have gotten better in the last two years. But when I did that experiment, as I kind of showed earlier, it just wasn't quite as good uh, as using that preserved details, details 2.0 out of Photoshop. Nick, Nick I, I can assure you that in the last two years, the difference is mind blowing. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's really crazy. Uh, and that's and the way, of course, no, and now is it's not called Gigapixel anymore. It's called Gigapixel AI. Um, oh, man. Throw that AI in there. Topaz Sharpen. It's called. Well, it's in a suite. Uh, Topaz uh, Topaz Photo AI which includes both denoise and sharpening and um, expanding files. And it will, <laughs> you made a statement early on that you can't take a five by seven and make a billboard out of it. Um, I, I, I might bet you that you could with this <laughs> new, AI. the new, this, this new software, the new AI stuff is it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I still use sharpen and denoise on a regular basis. Um, and in denoise in particular. So an image like what the one that's behind me on my screensaver is an example where I might run denoise and it's gonna do some really weird things to my my um, grass, for example, that I don't like, but it's gonna do some really, really good stuff to pull out the noise that's deep within that shadow detail that's back there by the mountains. And so in doing that, I'm gonna then just mask in the denoise functionality through Photoshop in just that one particular area. And so that's how I use denoise and sharpen more so than the other thing. But as you said, the advancements have been quite quite revolutionary. So that's a good thing too. Well, good questions. I don't have a ton of slides left so we can take more questions. Let me get through these and then uh, we'll take more questions and then call it a, let you guys get on with me. So, the main options that I would say the vast majority of what you can print on are canvas, wood, paper, metal, and acrylic. Uh, there's pros and cons to each of them. You can probably Google and see much more detail than I'm going to go into right now. Uh, in general, what I advise clients on if they ask me, uh, hey, what should I put this on or what do you like or whatever else? Canvas is a more timeless look. Um, it's going to have a much softer feel to it. It's going to be more sound deadening. You're going to lose a lot of detail. So if you have something, an image that really stands well on its detail, uh, whether it's a macro image or something else, canvas is going to oftentimes not be as good. 
Uh, metal is my preferred choice for printing um, purely because it balances durability, uh, lightweight, very, very lightweight, easy to hang, uh, really good color vibrancy within there. You can do different types of finishes, whether it's acrylic, semi-gloss, et cetera. Okay, acrylic. <laughs> well, I have a couple of acrylic prints that came from uh, Nevada Art Printers in Las Vegas. They do fantastic work. They're expensive. They look great and I would never want to touch them again because I'm afraid I'm going to break them. Um, so I find acrylic uh, very, very temperamental. Um, it can be very glare. Nevada Art does great work. It's probably some of my best looking prints, uh, but it's a very expensive process uh, compared to everything else. Wood is interesting in certain settings. I haven't really found a great audience for it, but it can be kind of fun uh, to print some particular things because you get that graining or whatever else. And then obviously uh, photo paper. Um, interestingly enough, I've started to get a lot more into creative printing. Um, so my printer, and just like a lot of other printers, can print uh, in what any kind of shape they can cut with a laser. Um, so I'm starting to print a lot of surfboards. I'm starting to print a lot of circles. Um, these are really, really big sellers. I've played around some other shapes that I haven't printed as much, but I, um, well, you could tell everybody actually out there, you guys print in the shape of Colorado, uh, as long as you're printing a landscape orientation print, because that's almost a perfect, you know, perfect rectangle all the way through there. I've printed one as the state of California, which was interesting and sells pretty well. Um, so that's kind of fun with the metals. Um, the do-it-yourself option is absolutely fantastic. I don't have a printer I can recommend uh, to people just because this changes so often. Uh, I have a Pixma Pro 100. I got it a couple. I got it seven years ago for less than 200 bucks off of some B and H special. Uh, I think it was like an end of life thing. The printer is absolutely fantastic. Um, but I can just say a lot of people swear by Canon. A lot of people swear by Epson. Uh, I don't think you're really going to go along either way. Um, one piece of advice I would have on a printer is check out the cost for replacement ink cartridges. Um, and I speak about this from a personal perspective. My personal business printer I purchased was an HP and the printer cost ink. The ink replacement is absolutely absurd. Um, so as soon as like, probably good, the thing starts to die in some other capacity, I'm gonna get rid of the printer just because it's so expensive to replace the ink. Uh, Canons are pretty reasonable uh, and they have eight um, particular uh, bays, I guess you could say for the, all the different colors which is nice because maybe you're gonna go through yellows a little bit more or something else. You can just replace that one um, and kind of go through there. Photo print companies, I would recommend. Um, Bay Photo does fantastic work. They're a little bit more expensive. They do have a 25% off coupon, BP25 for the first time you use them, which is really, really helpful. Um, so I use them for some of my work. I use them for all of my cards now, my greeting cards, McKenna is out of Waterloo, Iowa. Um, really fast shipping, $2 shipping. Uh, they do good metal work. They do a lot of my drop shipping work. Uh, White Wall is a company I've used. They're based in, you can believe it, out of Germany. Uh, and they ship through customs and get you your prints usually within a week, uh, which is great. But I use these guys for Canadian print orders or anything in the UK. Uh, and then locally, I use a company called Photo Printing Pros. Uh, they're down in Santa Barbara. Uh, they do great work. And this is one of those ones where the owner knows so much about printing. And if you tell them, hey, I got this particular issue with the print file, can you see what you can do about this or that? Or take a look at this. He can oftentimes really get in there uh, and make some meaningful changes. So for you, if you're gonna be printing your work a little bit more, I know there's some good printers in the Denver area. You may wanna find a smaller family business uh, that can kind of do some of the stuff for you too. Um, trying different types of products. Um, so I mentioned, uh, Bay Photo has the five free prints, um, so you can get a demo print there. They also have um, sample packs you can order of different types of metals, and so you can get like five or I think it's five different types of metal finishes, which is interesting. So whether it's a matte or a satin or a gloss or a high gloss, you can have those particular ones there, which is kind of interesting to be able to see and understand uh, yourself personally. Uh, the other two things I would recommend: um, one is Let's see, Red River Paper. This is their fine art photography uh, and discovery kit. It's like 14 bucks. You get, I can't remember how many, two times. I get about 20 different sheets of all kinds of different types of paper uh, you can print on. This has been really helpful for me to understand uh, different things, what they look like or how they print, so the black and white as well. 
Uh, and then Bay Photo also sells a sample pack from the company Moab. Uh, and that company has all the different types of print papers in there. So if you're trying to get a particular feel or whatever else, you can get those in there. Who would I not recommend? CG Pro Prints. Um, they push a lot in a lot of regards. The issue I have with them is they use different print labs throughout the nation. So you may order, like one time I ordered like 10 prints. They showed up in five different boxes from five different print labs and all over the U.S. And every single one of them was different. Because uh, they didn't, they don't have universal uh, calibration all the way across the board, uh, which was extremely frustrating um, all the way through there. Do not recommend them in any shape or form. Walgreens, absolute disaster, even though it's 100% money back guarantee. Oh my gosh, my, my print showed up and it was shaped like a U. Uh, it was a metal print that was completely bent into a U and it wasn't even from UPS. And the colors are so bad and oh, it was horrible. And then Walmart, same thing, um, really, really bad all the way through. Um, hundred percent money back guarantee. I thought all oh, these guys would be great for cards. They don't do anything on calibration as well. Uh, fine artwork, as I mentioned about our printers, uh, they do the Lumachrome type stuff. It's the stuff you'd see in like a Peter Lick type gallery, really, really beautiful, a little more expensive. Um, but if you have one particular print that you want to showcase uh, on Lumachrome, this is definitely a, a way I'd recommend somewhere kind of in between. You know, Costco used to have a full photo center within their, their stores. Um, I've heard mixed reports. I'm not a Costco member that you could still order online through their photo center uh, and get their particular things. I've actually sold a fair number of Costco prints years ago uh, because their price point was pretty good. Uh, and sometimes they'd come and they weren't right. You'd send them back, but other times they were really, really good and look great. So kind of that's somewhere in between. All right. So the final thing I'll mention um, before we kind of turn over to some final questions and um, get on our way is, I have been doing a speaker series um, starting in last shoot, October of 2022. It's been going that long, I guess, uh, with Mark Adamus. And then uh, tomorrow, I'm having Colleen Minnick. Uh, next week, I have Freeman Patterson aboard. And so you'll recognize a lot of these faces, uh, kind of well known star in arts. Bruce Barnbaum will be with me in a couple of weeks to talk about creativity. We've had some tremendous sessions from Zuebo Ho on black and white photography. Um, we did a great thing from Theo Bosboon on intimate landscapes as well. So all of these sessions are available on my website um, to be able to go in and purchase these. Uh, you get permanent access to them forever. Here's our creativity, kickstarting your creativity series uh, that's going on right now. I've seen a fair number of people that are part of this club that's part of this series. It's a great opportunity to get to ask questions of these people live. Uh, like I mentioned, Freeman Patterson, I'm super excited to have him down week after next. Guy Tall was last week. Then I'm going to have Bruce Barnbaum as well. So hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, and then as I mentioned in the earlier part, I have a two and a half hour version of this presentation. It actually might be almost three hours where I do some of the demonstrations in more detail. Um, there's also the PDF that goes along with this with some other information. Uh, and then it comes with these other two modules, um, the fixing some of your images and the plugins and post processing. So maybe you'll check that out. And with that, I want to say thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with you and I will take some more questions if there is some, otherwise I'll let you guys, uh, I'll start my share. I have a few more questions in uh, your comments about who to use for printing and so forth. Do you have any recommendations for people who actually know how to convert slides into good digital images? I don't, and I do get asked that question uh, a decent amount. There was a great company of all places, Bakersfield, California, which is not the best place in anywhere in the world you'd ever want to travel to. Um, but they went out of business, unfortunately. And they used to do, and I can't even remember the name of them, Horn Photo, I think. Uh, no, not Horn Photo. But anyways, they don't do it. I don't. Um, but I, you know, some of these print houses that are local, you may have already asked around, they may be doing that, but I'm not aware of any. Um, if you look on our website down the bottom of the footer, there's a couple links to a few places locally. There used to be a place called the Slide Printer, which I think they yes. are now called the Denver Digital Imaging Center. Um, so that's a place to check out. There's also a link there for a print company locally called Duraplac. Um, I know Dave Hull has used them before, was thoroughly impressed with what they produced for him. And if I remember right, uh, he mentioned he was a member of Focus Camera Club and they gave him a decent discount on it too. Um, that is something I need to check into. This was uh, over a year ago that Dave went there, but 
Um, those are two places that you can look. And again, those are linked down in the footer on our website. Thank you. My last question is, when you were talking about calibration, do you calibrate your, uh, your photos to the paper you're going to be printing on as well? <laughs> I, I like how you give me more credit than I actually do. Um, I don't calibrate to the actual print paper like I, you can. Um, so Red River, you can load the ICC profiles in and some of the other more sophisticated print company, paper companies you can. What I do do is I use the printer calibration settings within Print Studio Pro um, to calibrate to the type of printer and print paper I'm printing on. Um, so if it's going to be a glossy paper or semi-gloss, I will calibrate based on that. Um, but I haven't gone as far. Um, I'm not a purist in terms of how I print my black and white work as much as I would like to be, probably. Um, I don't just don't print enough of my black and white currently. Uh, but that is an example um, where print paper makes a huge difference and the calibration makes a massive difference. So I have a friend who's a well-accomplished black and white photographer and he prints specifically on photo rag, I think by, by, by Moab or Epson, I can't remember. Um, and he showed me some of the differences between the papers and it was absolutely dramatically dramatic. Nick, so, can you touch, touch a little bit more or explain a little bit more about ICC profiles? Cause I know a number of uh, print companies will provide them you know, because of the, they're using the Fuji machine or they're using a certain other machine or they're doing inkjet prints on Epson or something like that. And also about how paper companies have those available. Yeah. yeah so either they're going to do one or two, a good print lab is going to do one of two things. One, they're either going to automatically adjust the print based on after you sent them in, send it into them based on their ICC profile. Or two, they're going to be able to provide you the ICC profile, which you can then load into, which I showed you earlier on the convert to profile. You can actually convert it into that profile uh, on your computer, and then you could go through and make any changes you see to the image. Um, so that's one way. The other I can say, so Red River Paper does, um, that's where I order my card stock and print stock through, and they do have ICC profiles for different types of paper. And so you just go to their website, you download the profile, and then you load it in. Uh, to Photoshop to get that profile. I don't know if you want to add to that, Carl, but that's how I've used them. No, that, that's, that's, I've, I haven't done printing in quite a while, but I remember when I did it a lot that, you know, whatever paper I was loading into my Epson printer, I would, you know, pick the ICC profile and it would, you know, even though I've done all the image editing in Adobe RGB or whatever it was, you know, it would change the color slightly based on the type of paper it was going on, whether it's glossy or matte or something like that, so that it gives you a truer representation of, of what you're seeing on your calibrated screen. Yeah. Yeah. But then that, it walks through all those other steps too. Like don't, um, if you don't haven't calibrated your screen, there's no need to worry about the ICC profile stuff all right. the way through. So it's kind of things start to build on each other all the way through. So we're, we're on the same page. Good. So, Nick, to simplify this for, for me, let me just paraphrase here. So I've got a Canon Pro 200 printer with Canon. Um, only been printing on Canon paper, and they have their ICC profiles for the Canon paper. So that's pretty straightforward. So I go calibrate my screen or screens, right? You know, make sure it's an Adobe RGB. Send it to my Canon printer using the Canon ICC profile for the particular paper. Get that. But some of the calibrators can actually print you off a page that you can calibrate the printer to the screen. Have you have you dealt with that? And do you suggest that? Yeah. So we, um, you're pretty much correct, not completely, um, based yeah. on yeah. So thanks for guys and clarify. So you're gonna what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna want to process it as an Adobe RGB, yep. and then your final step will be to convert it to the ICC profile of your print paper within Photoshop before you print. So if um, you actually have that ICC and then if there's any tweaks or modifications you need to make then, then you make those before you print. So don't let it go to the print software and- Correct, yeah. Do it, do it in Photoshop before you send it to the printer. Correct, yeah. If you actually have that ICC profile within your printer, then you want to load that or within Photoshop, you want to make the changes then 
um, before you send it to the printer. Oh, okay. And then the other terminology, which is terminology is when I say printer, it means two things. <laughs> printer means your printer you have at home or printer means the company you use the printer work. Yeah. So I could probably be better at saying print company. So printers, you can't ask a printer to run calibration print, but a print company, they'll give you calibration print. So you can upload three to five images and they'll send you uh, calibration prints of their particular things. And, um, and same thing you could do is like through um, that link I mentioned for Red River Paper, it gets a sample pack. So you yourself can print those at home and see what they look like. And so I remember when I first started printing, oh, six, seven years ago, uh, I, I ordered one of those sample packs, a bigger one that had like 50, and I printed like 50 different papers because I had no idea what any of them, like what does a linen paper look like compared to a 80 pound polar rag print, et cetera, et cetera. And laid them all out there. I was able to see like, oh God, this metallic stuff's garish or this particular print kind of a mat looks really interesting in that, you know. So it was a good starting process all the way through. Oh, good. Yeah, Carl's Carl's all over the links. Jesus, I hire him to run my speaker series and put links in there. <laughs> I know it's helpful for people so they don't have to look it up. Unfortunately, oh, good. For people in the room, yeah, you got to go home and look it up. Sorry. <laughs> um, the other thing um, I was going to say was in Lightroom, as I remember, it has a soft proofing feature. Yes. Where you can where you can basically tell it that I'm going to be printing onto this paper or using this service and you specify an ICC profile and it shows you up on the screen what the final print should look like and give you an opportunity to kind of proof that and take a look at it and see if you want to make a few tweaks. Um, you know, because maybe if you're using like a, you know, like you said, a canvas or a rag paper or something like that, you know, where your colors may be a little bit muted and maybe a little softer or things like that, that you can make some tweaks before you actually Go ahead and print it out. Yeah, yeah, it's called soft. Yep, yeah, soft proofing. And it's another one that I have not used as much capability. This goes back to I think it was Andy asked the question earlier about uh, using the modules or whatever else or learning it yourself. It's like I learned how to do so much of the stuff without some of these really slick ways to to do it later. Then I need to reintegrate them in my workflow. But that's a, that's a problem for next week. <laughs> exactly. All right. Other questions. Have you ever used White House for a printing company? Yeah, I do. Um, so I, whenever I have a Canadian print order or anyone, it's not very often in the UK. Um, no, that's White Wall. Excuse me. I haven't used White House. I've used White Wall. Um, I haven't used White House. White House is but, quite good also. Yeah. Yeah, the, big, the biggest advice I give people is you know, different prints are going to look different on, from, you know, different capturing methods or whatever else is. Just order some test prints or get some calibration prints um, is the most beneficial thing you can do. Spend in, even if you have to spend, you know, 20 bucks to get 10 or 15 prints from a company to, to look at them and see what you like. I mean, it's one of the, the biggest things I teach about understanding your portfolio or styles or whatever else is printing your work. So you can start to see how things go together and how they fit together. Uh, and things just look so much different when we take that backlight away from an LCD screen. Uh, some prints that, you know, they're dogs on our computer screen look absolutely fantastic when you put them on paper and it's nice to look at them. All right. Well, I think I'm going to uh, go sign off then. It's nine o'clock down here and uh, my wife's patiently been sitting in the bed listening to on her iPad to uh, a movie that maybe I'll go say hi. So appreciate it, Nick. Thank you. Yep. Nick, thanks for such a great presentation. and It was great working with you. Yeah, my pleasure. No, it's like I said, I come back lately. And then uh, if people have follow-up questions, my uh, email is uh, nick, N-I-C, at stoverphoto.com, or you can find me through my website or nature photography classes. Just drop me a note. Uh, I'm happy to always converse with people, especially Coloradans. So. Hey, Nick. Well, yeah. Honestly, I, I, I joined the speaker series like the very when it started the very first time and I watched, did four or five and then I was on the road and I missed some and I know I have access to those but I'm not sure I know a how or b <laughs> that that membership you know was was annual and and maybe I only have those first five or six well we can uh I can look it up for you and let you know or you can log in uh, at any point in time so if you buy if you buy like an annual plan 
then you only have access during the annual period. Yeah. But if you purchase an individual class or a series, you have permanent access to that forever. Um, so, so if you purchase one of the series, then you'd have those. If you'd purchase just actually a, like a monthly plan or a yearly plan, then you would only have those particular ones. But we can, we can, once you log in, I can look it up for you. Or if you can't log in, just send me an email and I'll reset your login. But can I go back and, and make up a year? Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. We have a, the annual plan is 149. Um, and you can go back and catch all of the past speakers and any of the other classes and courses I've taught. Operators are standing by. Yeah, operators are standing by. Just uh, I don't even get to see your credit card though. But no, it's a it's a great value. We're actually going to increase the prices going up at the end of the month just because of all the speakers we brought on board and the amount of content. And it's uh, and it's, everything comes one hundred percent money back guarantee too. So if you watch a particular class or course and it doesn't satisfy what you want, just tell, just drop me an email. I'll give you your money back or give you another thing or whatever. No problem. Not in the business of being a shyster. No, the the five or six that I've watched were, I mean, they're amazing. I mean, they're yeah. Is Mark yeah, Adams the one who's the, like the most introverted guy on the planet? And you saw no, a guy, yeah, a guy tall would be the most introverted. Mark Mark's a little introverted too, but guys, guys, the most introverted one. Okay, yeah, <laughs> he was sitting outside uh, in the in the trees under uh, yeah, yeah. He was some so Mark Adams is for those of you that don't know is. Probably one of the more prolifically traveled nature and landscape photographers I've ever I've ever come across, ever gotten to know. And um, he's we sit down and like five minutes before we start, I'm like, okay, do you have any slides to show or what are you gonna do? What? You can show slides on Zoom? I didn't know that. That's incredible. And so he prepared his entire presentation just to talk about the trellis that was sitting above him and so on and so forth. And so it was, it was pretty fun. It was still a good pres great presentation, but yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. This was a, an excellent program. Uh, can't wait to go back over it and uh, and look through some of the things that you discussed. And I think this is, you know, a, a lot of people don't print, and hopefully that this will inspire people to to make some prints. You know, back in the day, I used to work for uh, Ritz Camera, Wolf Camera, and mm -hmm. one of the things that that we always said to people is like, it's not a it's not a photo unless you can hold it in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> of course, we were in the business of making prints, you know, that's where our profit center was basically, you know, the camera was just a way to get people in to uh, make prints, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is, it is kind of true, you know, there is something, I think you mentioned it, that is kind of magical and special, you know, to have an image printed that you can see that you can hold and, and yeah. That's yeah, I do, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't do calendars this year, but I usually do uh, calendars for friends and family and clients and it's hugely like it's, it's it's hugely inspirational to share these places and our experiences with people beyond you know devices you know, text messages or social media or website stuff and it just looks looks and feels different I and mean, some people are like calendar what do i do with this thing i only do what my phone tells me to do but you know giving, sharing our work with other people can be a lot of fun all right well um, all right well thanks well, thanks for having me i'll let you i know you had some other stuff to talk about so i'm going to drop off and then uh hopefully we'll see you again very good. Well, thank you All again, right. Nick. We really appreciate it. Bye. Bye. And yes, I do, I do have a uh, a few bullet points that I want to hit before we uh, take off for the evening. First and foremost would be, hey, thanks everybody for showing up tonight. That's really awesome. <laughs> um, also, a big thank you there to the people last year and this year um, who who have volunteered to. Uh, help run the club you know for the vice president treasurer and programs and everything else uh, we appreciate your efforts people uh, a quick reminder that uh, membership dues are due by the program meeting in february that's a change from in the past we used to go to march but i don't really see a point in waiting that long you know um, we can we can all get our stuff done and, and get it in in january in fact we've got uh, at last count, I saw about 20 people already who have uh, re up for the year. So appreciate all those people getting their stuff in quickly. We have an yeah. open competition in two weeks. Uh, on the 24th, uh, we will be gathering again, just as we did tonight, Lone Tree and Zoom. Make sure you get your submissions in that Saturday by midnight uh, before the competition meeting. 
Uh, I know that there will be just like the usual, there will be a flurry of activity, you know, three days prior to that, everybody puts their stuff in. But, um, do make sure you get those in. And uh, we've got uh, Paul Weinrausch, uh, who judged for us last year and also a couple of years prior, uh, will be our judge for the open competition. Anybody um, else have any comments yeah. or questions, sir? Yes. This is, um, we need to thank you also for all the work you've done. So. I will accept that. It's <laughs> <laughs> that. Carl, the other thing we need to do is is introduce uh, new members, and we've got one new member, right? There's a visitor. Visitor. A visitor, but after our... tonight I'll be a member. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, why don't could you uh, just tell us your name and uh, a little bit about the photography that you type like to shoot and whatnot, and how you heard about the club? My name is Robin Springer. I've been shooting forever. And I developed a lot of really bad habits, even when I was self-taught. And so I decided I wanted to change. And so I went to Rocky Mountain Photography School up in Montana for a while. Wow. And it was interesting. What changed my mind about joining here is a lot of what you did today reminded me of some of the classes I took. Mm -hmm. So it was really great. But also, it made me appreciate all the things that the photographers up there did, because I just felt I've got a long way to go, but I was, they prepared me really well. Photography that I shoot, I shoot, I'm gonna say it, travel, and I do special events, and I do documentary. But I wouldn't call myself a professional by any stretch of the imagination. I love photography too much, so I don't do any of that stuff for money anymore. Great. That's it. Yeah. Is Todd still on? Yes. Todd, why don't you uh, get some information to this young lady and uh, we can get her the information she needs to be able to join the club if she so chooses. That would be great. We'll get it. Uh, yep. An email. Yeah, we know we'd, we're we're loving new members. Exactly. Yeah. And if you yeah, like, I'll, uh, be, I'll be sending Todd information about. Uh, you know, get your email and everything else, Robin. So you'll be hearing from us again quickly. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And, and 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 hopefully in time to be in this next competition because the January competition is open, which just means there's no specific theme. And I'll bet I'll bet you've got something that fits that open. <laughs> just one would hope. Just, I agree. <laughs> Some somewhere in those archives. All right. Uh, anybody else wants to go uh, look at the Sandhill Cranes? Give me a, a call or an email asap. We got two days to book some uh, book some uh, rooms and lock in this rate. The normal rate's two hundred and fifty dollars a night at this place, which is pretty steep. But they're giving it to us for one hundred and seventy five. But they know they can sell them all, so. Um, they they only locked in that rate till this Friday. Todd, this Todd, it's Gary Witt. I'll be calling you. Good, good, and uh, and and go back and look at the email that Carl sent. If you can't, maybe he'll even resend it. It has lots of detail in it, including my Venmo. I have to have a seventy-seven dollar twenty-five cent deposit sent to me by on Venmo or. Zell within the next 48 hours. And then the nice. rest, the rest, the rest of it's due February 1st. Nice the whole good. thing's only like 300 and it's, it's less than $400. I mean, the, this um, one that we got the presentation on up in uh, Nebraska, I mean, it's, it's, it's too grand. Um, uh, Jeff Johnson, love it, love him, love him, uh, ran, ran a, seminar last by the way i'm getting paid nothing and uh no, nothing that i'm getting is comped zero i'm paying full price um uh but jeff johnson charged 1700 dollars for his uh outing last la last year so um this just is gonna be fun it's gonna be casual it's two nights probably have a, a group dinner one night uh welcome 
this place is so cool. You'll see it on the website, but there's only a couple of rooms left um, that are these big suites. And then uh, after that, you're in a yurt, which may change your thinking on the subject because uh, the, the yurts are absolutely stunning. I've stayed in both. Uh, but if it's 20 below, <clears throat> you'll be using the pellet stove. Yeah, Todd, I, I think I'll, uh, when we get off of here tonight, I'll, I'll resend the email about the, uh, the, the trip that you're doing with all the details and everything like I sent before, just to make sure everybody has it. Um, and I also will probably, we've, we've covered a, a lot of stuff tonight and had a lot of links and, and websites and, and businesses that, uh, Nick mentioned. So I may compose an email with all of that stuff in there too. So, all righty. Well, again, thank you all. Thank you for, uh, all the folks at Lone Tree and uh, folks on Zoom here, we appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all in two weeks of the competition meeting. Have a good evening. Thanks, Carl. All right.